The topic today is history's time-proven light therapy, and I am John Everblessed. This is part one of a three-part series. Um, let's start with a story from the Battle Creek Sanitarium. The following is a near miraculous healing story from the Battle Creek Sanitarium. It is Dr. Kellogg's light therapy treatment for a severe case of Raynaud's disease. Now, Raynaud's is a disease characterized by spasms of the arteries in the extremities, especially in the fingers. It is typically brought on by constant cold or vibration and leads to pallor, pain, numbness, and in severe cases, gangrene, such as this patient here. The pictures you've seen are samples. He didn't actually have pictures of those, so I substituted. <clears throat> This is Dr. Kellogg talking about Raynaud's. He says, the beneficial effects of light treatment in cases of this sort are frequently almost magical. The writer recalls a case of this disease treated years ago around 1902. A young woman, a school teacher, about 20 years of age. The toes of both feet were affected, those of the left foot more severely than the right. The little toe of the left foot had been amputated. One joint of the fourth toe had been lost. The third toe was black and cold, and the remaining toes were evidently very poorly supplied with blood. <clears throat> this is what he did. Three times a week, the light from a carbon arc lamp, that was the first tanning uh, device. Kind of like a light bulb, but not. The light from a carbon arc lamp was applied to the toe of both feet, toes of both feet, care being taken to avoid more than a very slight reaction. He was dealing with ultraviolet light, so he didn't want to get it too red. Well, so three times a week he did that, and at once the circulation in the feet improved. In a few days, the dark color began to disappear from the toes, which assumed a pinkish hue. Within a month, the tissues were normal in appearance, the feet warm. You're looking at five of those uh, arc lamps in this image from the uh, light therapy room at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. They were powered by two medically tuned carbon rods or welding rods with an electric arc burning between these two rods. These arc lamps, the modern replacement are the classic tan sun tanning bulbs, which we'll talk about in a bit. Okay, I saw and examined this patient more than one year later, and I was glad to learn that there had been no return of the disease. Now that, that is the level of healing we can expect from true light therapy. The users of modern day light therapy have no idea the true healing power of light. I can't find anything on the web even close to the kind of results that Dr. Kellogg achieved with an arc lamp. Now why is that? Why not? Because the most healing and biologically active component of sunlight, ultraviolet, is restricted, hobbled, and demonized in modern light therapy equipment by government agencies and the merchants of pharmacaea. Dr. Kellogg and the pioneer practitioners of light therapeutics back then were not so restricted. It was a brand new science. Now, concerning that Renaud's patient, Hold on. We all know that both UV and heat can turn the skin pink, right? Which is evidence of good circulation in that area. Which is exactly what is needed with Raynaud's disease. But it was the ultraviolet that enabled the circulation boost to stay for days. It outlasts by far both heat and hydrotherapy's circulation booth, <clears throat> boost. 
In other words, UV combined with penetrating heat affected a real cure, not just managed symptoms. So let's take a look at the light therapy equipment used at the Battle Creek Sanitarium to see which produced which, kind, which attributes of light. All right, this is a picture of an arc lamp. It used ultraviolet, heat, and visible white light. By the way, the pioneers of light therapy found that these could also reverse alopecia, alopecia if treated in the earliest stages. Baldness, losing of hair, that's what alopecia means. This is the women's light therapy department at Battle Creek Sanitarium. Most of the lamps in the pictures are arc lamps, but they use, they use ultraviolet, heat, and bright white light. There are two wrap-around metal uh, light boxes in the front left corner in the image there. They use, those are photophores. They use uh, incandescent light bulbs. They produce heat and light. Men's light therapy department at Battle Creek Sanitarium. The sunbathing slash tanning area used UV heat and bright light. This dental light therapy device used UV heat and bright light as well. And I'll, uh, I'll tell a few little healing stories of that a little later on. But this dental UV is a lost art. The incandescent heat lamp used two bulbs which provided heat and bright white light. I have lots of stories of those and we're soon going to tell those stories. This is the Battle Creek incandescent electric light bath cabinet invented by Dr. John Harvey Kellogg in 1891 at the Battle Creek Sanitarium soon after his friend Thomas Edison perfected that incandescent light bulb. It emitted both heat and white light, but no UV. <clears throat> this is a later version of the light bath. It, it produced heat and white light, just incandescent bulbs. It was lined with mirrors all the way around and powered with 50 Edison bulbs, about 50 watts each. Now, part two in this light therapy series is all about the light bath. I'll talk about that uh, a lot. Very interesting stuff. By the way, that light bath you see there, that one's mine. And it's just a bit older than Thomas Edison's. He owned one too. All right, light baths that used heat, white light, and UV. Those boxes on the outs, that box on the outside of the, uh, the drawing of the light bath, that's an arc lamp. And they're used in combination with incandescent bulbs. So you get the best of both. Kind of a tanning box. Battle Creek over the bed light baths, they produced heat and white light. These are portable wrap around incandescent fixtures. Wrap around a knee or a joint or a shoulder as you see. These are affixed incandescent fixtures. One for the trunk, one for the feet, and one for the spine. Heat and white light. So that was Kellogg's antique light therapy equipment. So what about today's light therapy devices? I mean, the variety online seems to be numberless. So how can we possibly know which to choose if we're looking for light therapy equipment? All right, the following four slides are just four screenshots out of hundreds that could be shown showing the wide variety of light therapy devices all claiming to be the latest and the greatest, referred to as LAGS, latest and greatest syndrome. Okay, screenshot number one. Let's give you a second here to absorb all those interesting little devices. You will begin to notice that most of these light therapy devices are use colored light. We we're going to talk about that. Number three, oh, rainbow colors. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> and number four, my favorite is the top left corner, the face masks. Favorite because it's so audacious. 
We cannot possibly vet each and every one of these things. We need a benchmark or a set of principles. So we go back to Kellogg. How did Dr. Kellogg and the pioneer practitioners know which kind of light therapy to use? All right. Dr. Kellogg studied God's original. What was God's original? The authentic sunlight. He studied the properties of sunlight and what sunlight could do for our health. Then he used only that light therapy equipment, which was in harmony with the laws of nature. Those that were designed to reproduce, as far as possible, the three main healing properties of sunlight, which is white, visible light, heat, and ultraviolet light. He mixed and matched those qualities in all his light therapy equipment. Those three attributes of sunlight are what we will look for in modern light therapy equipment. At least two, ideally three, but never just one healing quality. So the principle number one, sunlight is the standard. The more like sunlight, the better. So we just have to remind ourselves why light therapy devices were invented in the first place. It's such a basic uh, reason, because people weren't getting enough sunlight. Battle Creek Sanitarium was in Michigan. They had heavy winters. Winters. Hmm. OK. God's sunlight is made up of about 1,500 wavelengths, different wavelengths of light. Each has its own healing qualities, and we're placed there by God for good reasons. Sunlight is the gold standard by which all man-made light therapy devices should be judged. The light therapy device that is most like sunlight is the R40 sun lamp. R40 uh, is the term for that particular shape of light bulb. It emits ultraviolet light, heat, and white light. Unfortunately, Ah, the old-fashioned sun lamps are no longer marketed for human use in America. They have been repurposed as UVB reptile lamps. Wattage went from 275 to 160 watts. Fortunately, the vintage 270 watt lamps can be purchased on eBay. That's where I got mine. I looked one time, and there was a, a cornucopia. That's the, unnecessary. There were a lot of these online. Okay, what about colored light therapy? Like, for instance, red light therapy, infrared therapy, blue light, etc. Well, if we are trying to reproduce the healing qualities of sunlight, and sunlight produces white light, then principle number two must be that white light is right light. Colored light therapy is deficient, unnatural, and unnecessary. And actually, I, go sh I have some slides in here that show that it's actually harmful. Could be harmful. We'll get to that. All right, now when sunlight is passed through a prism, you all know this from elementary school, it is split apart into individual wavelengths. The wavelengths that make up the visible part of light can now be seen as individual colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Whole, complete, healthy light contains all those visible colors, plus the invisible wavelengths of infrared and ultraviolet light, etc. This is true, full spectrum light, true full spectrum light can only be found when those three elements are there and best in sunlight. All right, colored light is unnecessary. So with all that just now explained, which heat lamp emits the most red light? The clear white heat lamp or the red heat lamp? The answer, they both emit the same amount of red light. Their filaments are identical and generate the exact same white light containing all the colors. The bulb is identical, but the red tinted bulb filters out, blocks, all the other colors that make up white light. 
allowing only red wavelengths to pass. The clear bulb allows all colors that make up the visible white light to pass. Now the red tint does not transform the wavelengths of all the colors of white light into red light. No, no, no. It blocks all color wavelengths except red. Therefore, white light is the most healing bulb. It has more healing qualities, making red light unnecessary. White light is like organic seven grain whole bread. Red light is like, yeah, processed white bread that has had most of its nutrients and fiber stripped away. Therapy lights in the white bread category are red light therapy, red heat lamps, red infrared lights, red light therapy, blue light therapy, blue bilirubin lights, blue light sad lamps, colored light therapy, red laser therapy, individual rainbow colors, etc. Now here's an, uh, uh, an important principle here. It's not the red light that's effective, it's the heat that's effective, not the red color. The red tint has made the light deficient, which was totally unnecessary. It was not an enhancement. Yet the vast majority of today's light therapy equipment seems to be colored. Colored light is the identifying mark of bad science and deception. You repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. The more of the healing wavelengths we strip from light, the less healing it is. We invite disaster when we start fooling with God's natural order of things. There is a point where our manipulated Manipulated light can do more harm than good. Manipulated light. Five quick examples of that. All right. <clears throat> Eyes react badly to isolated colored light over time. This is Dr. Kondrat speaking. He's an eye specialist. In the early 60s, Dr. John Ott was reproached, approached by Dr. Thomas Dickinson who was researching the effects of different drugs on the eye. <clears throat> Much to their surprise, retinal cells responded the same way to light as chloroplasts in plants. Well, that doesn't mean much to us yet. They observed the little tiny particles called granules moving in a similar pattern in response to blue, red, and natural light. And now he's going to explain that. The granules tended to clump in blue light they should be moving, circulating, but they clump. Havoc under red light. Havoc? What is havoc? Widespread self-destruction. They break open the cells. But normal flow, they have a normal flow under natural light. Now this surprised Dr. Dickinson since strong drugs did not affect the cells as much as light did. We're going to come back to this blue and this colored light stuff. All right. Since the 1950s, this is a different story, jaundice in newborn babies has been successfully treated with blue light. We've heard that. Westinghouse made a very strong blue light for this purpose, but it tended to nauseate the nurses. So if it's making the nurses sick, what is it doing to the babies? <clears throat> Dr. John Ott worked with Dr. Gerald Lucy, professor of pediatrics at the University of Vermont College of Medicine, and they now use full-spectrum fluorescent lights containing the normal amount of blue in sunlight. This corrects the jaundice and gives the infants a balanced, balanced dose of other wavelengths, and the nurses no longer get sick. Uh, and yet, now hospitals have gone back to using blue light, which they place under the baby's back. That's interesting. Even though simple full-spectrum fluorescent lighting would have solved the issue. Now they use a very expensive light. But it's in partnership with all the other colored wavelengths of visible light. 
Traditionally, a jaundiced baby would simply be placed in the sunlight. It was simple. But notice something new here, that even visible light can be absorbed through the skin and can affect our health. That's interesting. Because that visible blue light on the back doesn't produce heat either. Or at least not significantly, no. Eliminating UV may cause macular degeneration. This is interesting. In 1964, John Ott, along with Dr. Irvine Leopold, studied the effects of light on rabbit retinal pigment epithelial cells, the eyes. They documented that retinal pigment epithelial would not divide unless they were exposed to low levels of ultraviolet light. What this means is that UV, UV light is necessary for our eye health. Severe deprivation of UV light might be a contributing cause of macular degeneration. So when he says here that it won't divide, that simply seems to indicate that the cells will not be able to replicate or regenerate. This doesn't happen instantly, but the longer, the longer we're exposed to isolated light, the more likely we're going to get our eyes hurt, damaged. This is Dr. Alexander Wunsch. Don't know how to pronounce that name. <clears throat> He's a German photobiologist. He says blue light isolated from all other colors on the light spectrum is damaging our retinas and disrupting our endocrine system, resulting in all sorts of physical and mental illness. That's interesting. Light, he continues, light without its partner, heat, is damaging to the eyes. He says, near infrared is important as it primes the cells in your retina for repair and regeneration. Which explains why LEDs, which is devoid of infrared, are so harmful for your eyes and health, he says. In other words, light delivered without heat is harmful for our eyes and health. Humans' natural lighting has always been from fire, sunlight, campfires, candles fire, etc., which sums up principle number three, a natural healing alliance exists between light and heat. Light without heat is unnatural and unnecessary. Think LEDs. That's a whole brand new concept when LEDs came out. Light without heat. Principle number four, Price is unrelated to effectiveness or efficacy. All right. <clears throat> this is this device you're looking at. I'm going to quote their words. Bioptron, that's the name of this. Bioptron Medical Light Therapy, a revolutionary medical technology. Colored light therapy is a technique of restoring balance by means of applying color to the body. This is their words. Now, I had a friend at uh, the last church I was at. Tell me about her mother back in Russia who was seriously considering buying one of these devices. My friend knew that I was into light. I'd give him light presentations there at the church. She asked me my thoughts on it, and I told her basically what I'm about to tell you. Now, first I explained this. The bioptron includes a light source and colored light filters. Basically, that was it. And this is what it claims. Red activates and revitalizes. Orange restores and animates. Yellow fortifies and brightens. Green balances and relaxes. Blue soothes and calms. Indigo purifies and focuses. This is a script. Violet inspires and supports. Really, I mean, that's so schmaltzy here. This is what they claim it, it treats. Now this one, this uh, light, works on this here. Wounds, pain, skin problems, sports injuries, pediatrics, and SADS, seasonal affective disorders. And their price for this magical device? $3,220 on Amazon. For what? <laughs> Here 
here's the truth. We've already shown that white light emits all those colored wavelengths at the same time and working together synergistically. A simple heat lamp could do the same thing and far better for around $5. For 150 years, the same health conditions listed in this company's ads have been successfully treated with a simple incandescent light bulb or heat lamp. Dr. Kellogg proved it. The pioneers of light therapy proved it. <clears throat> God already had this stuff figured out. He designed that all these colors work together in harmony, enhancing each other. So deliberate disassembly of light is a lying science and a waste of healing light waves and money, your money. Colored light therapy is a scam. An educated consumer is not their company's best customer. <clears throat> By the way, the bulb used in this bioptron lamp that you're looking at <clears throat> is just a common little incandescent halogen bulb such as it you see in your headlamps, in your uh, car's headlights. If it's effective at all, it's the heat that's doing it. This company's marketing scheme is pure deception. Do not fall victim. It's, you know, the, the, the bigger the lie, the more people tend to believe it. And this is a brash lie. The next device also claims all sorts of health and spiritual benefits now. Crystal light, notice, notice all these big old jargon words here. Crystal light bed chromotherapy quartz spa. Reiki chakras, quantum resonance. Quantum resonance, I gotta get me one of these. Holistic, natural, healing, God. Radio esthesy, <laughs> Hindu. Wow, I mean, just throw a few key words at it and bam, instant seller, $2,100. One light bulb would replace all of that. Incandescent white light. <clears throat> You notice the symbolism on this device as well? See all this carved in the wood? $2,100 to take healing whole light and split it up into colors. A simple white light bulb would be more effective than this and would have provided the same colors. So moving on to principle number five, simple is best. Complicated is a red flag. <clears throat> simple recommends itself to the intellect, and it is one of the characteristics of God's healing methods. Beware of our own human nature to succumb to lags, the latest and greatest syndrome. <clears throat> the best example of simple is the historical use of incandescent light bulbs as therapy. They are also inexpensive, effective, and thoroughly time-proven. It beats out the latest and greatest every time. Now, the incandescent light emits white light and heat working together in harmony, which we know. Incandescent sun lamps, tanning bulbs, emit ultraviolet and that visible white light and heat. Incandescents have been the core of effective light therapy since Dr. Kellogg incorporated them into health care. I need to make a, um, an observation here. <laughs> it's almost a disappointment to bring to you um, a presentation on light therapy and boil it down to the most simplest little things. This guy, well, wait a minute, but I thought light therapy was like magical. Well, sorry, it's simple. That's why we, are, we succumb to the latest and greatest so much with our human natures. All of the Battle Creek Sanitarium light therapy devices emitted white light and heat. Metal heated to incandescence. In other words, the metal was so hot that it emitted white light. Dr. Kellogg referred to that as a luminous 
heat source or luminous heat. Luminous heat has, addish, has additional healing qualities that non-luminous heat sources do not possess. Which brings us to the topic of visible luminous heat versus visible infrared heat. Let's let Dr. Kellogg explain this and its implications. <clears throat> Take in that, those two charts here. Let's explain it. This graphic was taken from Dr. Kellogg's book, Light Therapeutics. You will note in the top graph that, that heat rays are emitted from both the invisible infrared spectrum of light and the visible spectrum of light. I mean, that may be news to most viewers around the world, it was to me, given that infrared has been widely marketed as though it is the one and only source of heat from sunlight and light therapy. Not true. The truth is that it's not even the best source of heat in sunlight. In the heat curve above, you can see that heat rays peak. See that red, li red line there, red vertical line? That heat rays peak over the visible red spectrum. We're talking sunlight here. And it's called luminous heat, not the infrared section. The second graph shows that the bulk of the penetrating heat rays are found in the visible spectrum. And it continues into a bit of the near infrared spectrum. So what does this mean in practical application? It means that the most therapeutic heat rays come from the visible spectrum on light and somewhat into the near infrared. <clears throat> Yet the vast majority of marketing spin for modern light therapy seems to hover around the infrared. <clears throat> I mean, what's up with that? Let me give you a side-by-side -side real life application of the use of these two spectrums in light therapy. I used to sell saunas, so this is gonna be relevant. <clears throat> Here we have an infrared sauna, I used to sell those. Side by side to a Battle Creek incandescent light bath, which is luminous heat. The infrared sauna is non-luminous heat. The therapeutic range of the sauna is 115 to 135 degrees Fahrenheit, and you have to seal yourself up in that thing at that temperature. Does that seem right to you? The therapeutic range of the light bath is only 86 degrees to 110 degrees. <clears throat> it can go higher, but it's not necessary. So even at such a lower temperature, the incandescent electric light bath cabinet feels warmer, more penetrating than the standard infrared sauna, even with the top doors open throughout the session. <clears throat> An infrared sauna feels like standing in the shade on a warm day. A Battle Creek Sanitarium light bath feels like standing in the sunlight on that same warm day. That means that the temperature in the luminous heat cabinet <clears throat> need not be nearly so hot as the infrared cabinet needs to be. Sunlight is a luminous heat source. Now both these cabinets emit infrared, but the light bath has the added benefit of luminous heat. Oh, and um, by the way, unlike the infrared sauna, the light bath produces instant, full throttle heat the moment the switches are turned on. No warm up required at all. Here's Dr. Kellogg's take on infrared versus luminous heat, <clears throat> versus luminous heat light therapy devices. And he gets pretty heated about it at one point. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is him quoted. All heated bodies give rise to infrared rays. This is true of both luminous and non-luminous heated bodies. 
the idea that rays from non-luminous heated bodies have a greater penetrating power than those with luminous heated bodies is wholly without foundation and is based upon gross ignorance of the physics of light. This is Kellogg. Both the profession and the public have been shamefully imposed upon by manufacturers who have exploited the infrared idea in the sale of appliances possessing less therapeutic efficiency than an ordinary hot sandbag or hot water bottle. You know, a prophet of the Lord referred to him as the greatest physician in our world. <clears throat> He's not saying here that infrared heat is not beneficial. He is saying that as a heat source, it's not delivered as efficiently or deeply as heat from a luminous source. Just being fair here. <clears throat> Below, Kellogg is re referencing the research of Carl Sohn of Copenhagen, the able phys physicist associated with the famous Finsen Institute. Dr. Finson was the physician who won the Nobel Prize in 1903 for his use of luminous rays in the treatment of lupus. Song concluded via experimentation that luminous heat rays have a skin penetrating power practically double that of near infrared. And he gets stronger here. He showed that the penetrating power of near-infrared rays diminishes to near insignificance as the wavelength increases and moves toward and into the far-infrared, far-infrared saunas. He showed that far-infrared is non-penetrating. Wow. Uh, I'm going to have to repeat that. He showed that far-infrared is non-penetrating. Light Therapeutics, 1927, page 53 through 67. He continues, the great physicist Fortier and afterward Professor Tyndall showed that the dark heat rays have not the penetrating power of the rays of shorter wavelength, which are found in the visible spectrum. Dark heat rays, that is, the rays given off by ordinary non-luminous heat bodies, such as heat from a stove or a steam coil, are not even capable of passing through ordinary glass. Is that true? All right. Well, let's take a quick tour of my light therapy room in my home and do some experimenting. Okay, before we start our experiment, whether infrared or, well, the difference between infrared and um, luminous heat, let's give you a tour of my light therapy room. All right, this is my Battle Creek Sanitarium light bath. Let's open it up for you here. Notice the six switches here. Get the camera at that. Notice the mirror on the doors and all the way around. Back up so you get a view. Now let's turn that on. We're, this is going to be part of the experiment as well, but first let me give me a tour of this. Turn that on. <clears throat> okay, those are original Thomas Edison incandescent electric light bath, electric lights, excuse me. They last forever. These are at least 100 years old. They stopped making these in about 1932 when the market crashed. <clears throat> you see down, down below, there are two light bulbs down there on the floor for your feet. Give you a little look what that looks like in the infinity effect. Look at that. Sitting in this thing is like immersing yourself in warm healing light. It's, I used to sell saunas and there was nothing. Never been an improvement over a light bath. So, all right. Back off and you can see that. Okay. Now, let me shut off these lights, because I can't have all the lights on in this light therapy room at the same time, else I'll blow the fuses. Shutting this off, so you get a bigger, better picture of the side here. There it is. Okay. All right. 
Let me turn around and get you a bigger picture of the whole room. That is black light, just simple black light you'd buy at Walmart, at least you used to be able to. You just hang them around the house wherever you're working for added low level ultraviolet light. All right. This is actually a dark room. It's kind of ironic to have a light therapy room in a dark room. That's our light, excuse me, that's our tanning bed. It's not a commercial one. Commercial ones have twice as many bulbs, but it works. This one right here, gotta get the full view here. That is a very practical answer for how to build your own light bath. Just a uh, massage bed and some chicken lights hanging from a, a clothes rod. That is my actual closet. Notice the bookcase up there. And right down there, the drawers, that center one, you pull it out and it becomes a step up to that. Uh, we haven't put the curtains up. I just created this two days ago. We put a curtain up there. And very, very practical way to make a light bath. The thing that we just saw, the Kellogg Battle Creek Sanitarium light bath, very expensive to make, exceedingly time intensive to make. And there's a huge advantage to just lying down. All right, now let me shut off these lights. Here we go. All right, now we turn back on around. What you see here is a barrel light bath. This is meant to, you know, you, you lay it down on top of a person who's on top of a bed uh, or a table, a treatment table. And there's hinges involved with this thing and a big long rod and it slides back and forth on the table depending on where you want the light, on your trunk or on your legs. Let me turn that on real quick. Oh, and here's the table full of other little gadgets, light therapy equipment, mostly antiques. Turn this one on. Okay, same light bulbs that are in the, in the light bath. These were very popular back then. Okay, back to this table full of gadgets. <clears throat> Start with number one. This is an arc lamp. This, there's a story in Light Therapy 1, which you, we already read if you're seeing this, where Raynaud's was reversed using something like this. Those are two, basically they're welding rods, and that coil that goes all the way around it like that, that's a heater, because heat enhances ultraviolet light. This is the original box of therapeutic carbons. They come in different formulas depending on whether you want more heat or you want more ultraviolet light. There are all sorts of different brands and different sizes. This is a small size. I used to have, the, I think, the largest private collection of Battle Creek Sanitarium light therapy equipment. Um, I got so tired of just moving them from place to place and paying for storage, I just donated it all to Historic Adventist Village. I kept one. All right. This right here is Dr. John Ott's Sad Light, Seasonal Affective Disorder Bright Light Therapy Box. I have it open here, but his was totally unique in that, you see right there in the center, that is an ultraviolet light in a Seasonal Affective Disorder Box. All right, let me turn the switch on. He has two bright lights and a, um, and a unfiltered black light. I used to have this on my desk at work when I worked on the night shift in the long-term care facility. I was doing my paperwork. Patients were asleep and I would do my paperwork at arm's length, right about this distance. It never hurt my eyes. Uh, Right. Uh, this was a very nice device. Unfortunately, now it's illegal to put ultraviolet light in a sad box. But if, um, fortunately, I have one of these, so I can still use it and get that benefit had I need, needed it. Um, okay, let's shut this one off. We're about to start the testing. This is a, hold on, look at that switch. That is a Battle Creek Sanitarium Photo 4. Two antique light bulbs, just like in the light bath. 
<clears throat> I use that all the time. If I get indigestion, heartburn, or clogged up, you put one of these things on me 20, 30 minutes, usually solves the problem right away. And I have lots of stories about the use of that wonderful little device. All right, I'm gonna shut this off. We move on to right there. Let me close this door because I gotta put some things in order here. Hold on. Okay, I'm gonna pull this back over now that the door is closed. Okay, this begins the experiments. Now this device right here, it's just a simple light fixture, but it contains an infrared heater, such as would, and it screws right into a light socket, such as was, would be used in a reptile habitat or a baby chicks, keep them warm. 250 watts as compared to that, a 250 watt heat lamp, clear heat lamp. We're gonna compare them. The experiment is, remember that Dr. Kellogg said that, uh, uh, that infrared does not have penetrating power. Why, it won't even go through glass, she, he says. So we're gonna, and it didn't compare to luminous heat, the white lamp. So we'll see if there's any physical difference in this radiometer, what happens in the radiometer. Now this, radio, this infrared lamp has been on for quite some time. It's heated up fully. Put it about six inches from it. See if it turns it. He said it doesn't penetrate glass, or at least it's not very effective at doing so. Okay, so there's no luminous heat here, but there is some heat. And it turns that radiometer just very, very slowly. That is not, well, it's not really significant. All right, we immediately put it in front of, we stop it, put it in front of the clear 250 watt heat lamp. All right, here we go, whoa, look at that. You can even hear it. I'm not sure if this is catching, if the microphone can catch it or not, but. All right, there's that. So, whoa, there is a difference. Clearly a difference between luminous heat and infrared heat. All right, let's shut that off. Stop this. Cool it down a bit. Put it in front of a 1970s sort of, um, come on, it takes a while for this thing to cool back down. 1970s heat lamp. Here we go, about the same distance. All right, I'm trying to get it so it doesn't get that light smack dab in it. There. Okay, it's beginning to turn the proper way. It's going faster and faster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The heat lamp uh, puts out heat and ultraviolet light and bright light. It is basically the ideal light therapy device. Of course, I go into more detail in my presentation. This thing's spinning faster now. Still not quite as fast as a plain old heat lamp. You can still buy these 1970 things on eBay. That's where I found mine. I found several at the same time at first look. Um, if you're wanting such a thing, eBay is the place to do it. Okay, so that, I think that kind of solves that question. <laughs> But since we have some other light sources here, let's try that too. We're going to end up with the light source with a uh, with a light bath followed by sunlight. All right, shutting that down. All right, this is it in front of bright light and <clears throat> and a little bit of UV and basically no heat. Eh, nothing significant there at all. Okay, that's unfortunate. Well, I'm not going to turn that thing on. That's that's probably going to ruin my camera if I stare, have it stare at that. Okay, shutting that off. While we're on that, let's do another one of these things right here in the tanning bed. Ready? Bright lights, UV, but no 
is no significant heat. Okay. Yeah, and that's not going to change either. All right, let's take this out. Shut that off. Last, well, second to the last thing is the light bath. And the... All right. Still has some residual heat on it. Let me turn the switches on. About 70 degrees there, 75 degrees, and there it goes. Yep. Definite, definitely a difference between this and uh, infrared. I uh, didn't have access to an infrared sauna to put it in, but I did it years ago when I was selling saunas. Side by side, I had a light bath in the same room as an infrared sauna. And I put this, you see what it does in a light bath. I put it in an infrared sauna, it just sat there. Didn't do anything, even though it was much hotter. So. All right, the final thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go outside and see if it spins in the shade and then we see if it spins in direct sunlight. All right, here we go. Okay, this is the radiometer. 38 degrees, 2.30 in the afternoon, December 6, 6 or 7, I forget. Anyway, it's just sitting here in the shade. All right, now we're gonna take it over to that picnic table. It is 2.30 in the afternoon, so it won't be very bright. Uh, we shall see. Let me shut. Okay, again, 2.30 in the afternoon. This is direct sunlight. It's not very, if it was, you know, 12 noon, it would be even faster. This is luminous heat from the sun, even though it's very cold here. Light turns into heat when it touches something. All right, that's it for the experiments. Okay, that was kind of telling. There has always been a natural alliance between light and heat. Now in this three-part light therapy series, we will be addressing just five basic kinds of light therapy equipment. Four historical and one modern device. <clears throat> These are the ones that attempt to reproduce the main healing components of sunlight, simply and without gimmick. The rest, I ignore, because there's thousands out there, all claiming to be the latest and greatest. Number one, lamps, heat lamps, sun lamps, such as you see here. Number two, light boxes. Uh, these are sad boxes for seasonal affective disorder. This is the modern piece of equipment. Dr. Kelly didn't use these. <clears throat> Tanning chambers. Now, these are the three that we will address in this part one presentation. The next two have their own presentations, part two and part three. Light baths and ultraviolet blood irradiation. These five are the non-gimmick devices, and we start with lamps, also known as photophores. By the way, light baths and UBI, especially UBI, I can't wait to get to that. It's incredibly powerful. Okay, photophores. Fancy name for incandescent bulbs for a light fixture. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg used the term photophore to describe his new portable incandescent electrolyte fixtures that, that use Edison's newly perfected incandescent electrolyte bulbs as a source of therapeutic luminous heat. Dr. Kellogg was the first to use Edison's bulbs therapeutically. He demonstrated that heat from a luminous source is far more penetrating and effective than heat from a non-luminous source, which we've covered. Photophores started out as simple incandescent bulbs, but now include incandescent heat lamps and sun lamps. <clears throat> oh, by the way, see that pamphlet there? A number of my stories that I'm gonna present come from that little booklet, filled with healing stories of the use of that device medically. <clears throat> Photophores ultraviolet. 
Ultraviolet sun lamps offer the same benefits as incandescent heat lamps, but the therapeutic effect lasts much longer. Days instead of hours. Think of skin turning pink when spending time in the sun. That's the blood coming to the surface via ultraviolet light. The photophore's therapeutic value. All right, heat. Heat causes the blood vessels to dilate, which can be used to increase blood flow to areas of chronic pain, tightness, and muscle spasms. Pain relief. Heat is a natural pain reliever. The more penetrating, the better. The more penetrating, better. The more penetrating, the better. Decrease inflammation. Number four, relaxes muscles. Number five, it speeds healing. <clears throat> this is a typical modern photo for there's all sorts of versions of this heat lamps emit bright visible light and luminous heat invisible light that may be felt as heat all right sun lamps would contain the most healing qualities the most therapeutic of all sun lamps versus heat lamps <clears throat> this is the original incandescent photo force from the battle creek sanitarium Heat lamps and sun, sun lamps were used at most sanitariums and hospitals. This is not the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Notice that's a military hospital. They were everywhere. They knew it worked. All right, this is an arc lamp from that first story we got. This is an arc lamp with added luminous heat. There's a coil in there. You just barely see it if you're looking at the top slightly left. A little coil sticking out. All right, they added luminous heat <clears throat> because heat enhances the effect of UV. And this combination was very common in, these, in this light, therapeutic, light therapy equipment. All right, this is where we start telling the healing stories and the doctor's observations. All right. Photophores for sciatica and deep-seated pain. And this is Dr. Kellogg talking. When I discovered in 1891 the superior value of the electric light as a source of heat, I soon observed that overheating of the skin surface was a serious obstacle in the way of securing the highest degree of efficiency for the reason that it prevented the use of a sufficient volume of heat to influence strongly the deeper tissues. I endeavored to overcome the difficulty in various ways and finally solved the problem by, directly, by directing upon the treated surface a current of air, a current of air, a fan. By this means, oh, and there is a, a fan in this picture. By this means, I was able to double and even quadruple the volume of heat radiation employed in treatment. I've used it that way and it is amazing. This means that by simply cooling of the skin, quantities of heat may be applied which would otherwise be absolutely intolerable and would give rise to destruction of tissue if long continued and without the slightest injury to the skin tissues or any interference with the passage of the penetrating heat rays to the deeper structures. From the above, it must be evident that the combination of the cooling air current with application of radiant energy from the arc light or the incandescent lamp is a matter of very great practical importance. This statement is clearly borne out by clinical experience. This is Kellogg's clinical experience. In cases in which no relief from pain is obtainable by ordinary hot applications, this is very, very practical here. I'm going to start that sentence again. In cases in which no relief from pain is obtainable by ordinary hot applications, the massive doses of radiant energy which may be employed by this method cause it quickly to disappear. This intensive method of applying heat is especially valuable in cases of deep-seated sciatica and in certain cases of visceral diseases. <laughs> very, very, very practical. Never let the skin temperature 
rise above 110 degrees Fahrenheit or 43 degrees centigrade. This may be easily monitored by an infrared thermometer. Adjust temperature by changing the distance of the light to the skin. This is especially needed in applying luminous heat to an infant or to the feet of a diabetic. As long as you're monitoring the temperature, don't make it over 110, it's safe to use it on a diabetic or a baby. With an infrared thermometer, the attendant doesn't need to touch the one being treated. It's very simple, inexpensive, you can get it anywhere, and gives instant results. Ultimately, the client has the final say, of course, on how much heat he can tolerate. Photophor treatments usually require no more than 20 minutes. <clears throat> Remember, never let the skin temperature go above 110 degrees Fahrenheit or 43 degrees centigrade. Bone fractures and light bulbs. Light bulbs and bone fractures. This is Dr. Kellogg talking. The writer has for many years practiced the application of heat in some form in all cases of fracture before attempting to adjust the bones or applying a permanent dressing. Either the arc light or the photophore affords the most efficient means of applying heat, in other words light, both of those are light, <clears throat> of applying heat in these cases because of the highly penetrating character of the luminous and infrared rays. Intensive applications are best. The surface being cooled by a continuous air current. Such an application continued for 15 or 20 minutes relieves pain, lessens spasm, and so greatly facilitates the reduction of the fracture that with gentle manipulation, the bones may be brought perfectly in place without the aid of an anesthetic. Reduction means realignment of a body part to normal position. We're gonna need that out in the field. We don't have access to hospitals. Colic and indigestion, using the Battle Creek photophore. All right. Colic has for many years, remember this is from that booklet. Colic has for many, put out by the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Start again. Colic has for many years been the fear of the mother during all the early years of each child's life. Successful treatment of each case means a large burden off the mind of the mother and a tremendous relief to the bowels of the baby. There are no other types of cases in the infant life that so completely and so satisfactorily reacts to the heat of an electric light. I'm gonna read that again. There are no other types of cases in the infant life that so completely and so satisfactorily reacts to the heat of an electric light. The fact that the photophore gives both light and heat rays puts it in the class of a specific for colic. Okay. Application of the photophore over the stomach with the shell in direct contact with the skin will give early and very complete relief. The treatment should be given as soon as the typical crying of a colicky baby begins and kept up until the baby ceases crying. If the case is extreme, and the child goes into colic convulsions, no time should be lost in calling the doctor. The heat may then be applied according to his instructions. Five minutes at a single time will prove ample and not too severe for the tender skin of the small baby. I have one of those things, it's one of those photophores. It's been very effective on me. <clears throat> Whether you, whether you use a modern heat lamp or a simple incandescent light bulb with a reflector, adjust the distance and or a fan aimed at the tummy so that the baby's skin temperature never goes higher than 110 degrees. Use that infrared thermometer for instant measurements. Practice this adjusting on yourself 
And when you have the optimal distance and temperature figured out, then set it up on the baby. If you're using a heat lamp, cover the baby's eyes with a cloth to protect from heat and extreme brightness. The photophor in this image has two antique Edison light bulbs uh, around 50 watts each. They put out more heat than light. Now we have heat lamps, which are much stronger. Those old bulbs put out more heat than light, but like I say, it was very mild. I have found by personal experience that luminous heat is consistently effective on trapped gas on me, as well as indigestion. I usually feel better within 20 minutes or fall asleep feeling better. All right, juvenile arthritis. This is from a lifestyle center that I was working at. I was consulting with them on light therapy. A mother came with her son. He was a 13-year-old boy. He arrived at the health retreat in a wheelchair, unable to walk. He had a severe chronic arthritis-like idiopathic condition. Idiopathic meaning it's unexplained. The cause is unascertained. Arthritis-like idiopathic condition that left him in significant pain, immobilized with atrophied muscles and swollen feet. He was in a wheelchair. It started about four and a half years previous. We started him on a far infrared sauna, the non-visible heating wavelengths of light, which he liked and said helped somewhat. However, it was the 250 watt clear heat lamps to his feet that really made the difference. This is, this is his testimony. Each session made more progress in relieving pain, decreasing the swelling and increasing mobility. Even the first 20 minute session enabled him to move his feet up and down. He hadn't been able to do that. And with far less discomfort. Now this image was not his feet. It's just what I happen to find. He did 20 to 60 minutes of sun lamps only four times during his stay. He used the heat lamps several hours per day, divided into two sessions per day of the heat lamps to feet and or hip, and sometimes for the entire body in the form of light bath. He did this on his own. He decided what was good for him, how much he needed, and how much he wanted. So we let it happen. Within the first week, he was able to stand, stand, and take a step. This is huge. Before he started light therapy, his pain was 7 out of 10. The day he left, it was down to a 3 out of 10. His feet measured 24.5 centimeters in circumference before the light therapy and 18 centimeters by the time he left for home. He's continuing light therapy at home. Rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, this was at that same lifestyle center. This was a 70 plus year old male with a 30 year history of debilitating rheumatoid arthritis, just like you see in those pictures. 30 years. Whenever he would sit, he would fall asleep. Whenever. He started regular use of a tanning bed, my tanning bed, sun lamps and heat lamps. He stated he felt better and had more energy after the very first UV bed session. He started using the heat lamps and sun lamps on his knees and found that it decreased pain and swelling from the beginning. So simple. It was progressively removing the pain in his knees. When he used it on his shoulders for a while, it completely ended the pain there and gave them their mobility back. The pain and soreness caused by his occasional heavy physical labor is immediately diminished or relieved by the lamps. <clears throat> Using the lights before bed 
enabled him to sleep very, very well. After several days of using UV and heat lamps, he woke up stating that he felt wonderful. He uses the UV three times a week and the 250 watt clear heat lamps the other four days a week. Now this is interesting. He tried doctor recommended drugs once for 10 days, steroids. It helped for a bit, then got worse. He stated that it made him smell like a dead man. What's that about? Months after this, this man came up to me happy, pleasant, talkative, and told me how much light was helping him. For the two years I had known this man, before the light therapy started, he could never have been described as happy, pleasant, or talkative. Heat lamps and sun lamps. Diabetic ulcer. This was at a different lifestyle center. When working with this lifestyle center in Michigan, we had a client come in with a 1.5 inch diameter open diabetic sore on his lower leg. It was about an eighth inch to 3 16 inch deep, which caused the patient continuous pain. We immediately applied a charcoal and comfrey poultice, which he wore overnight. When he awoke the next morning, he stated that it had been the first time in months that he had slept through the night, and that without pain. Since the wet charcoal poultice had made his legs soggy and wrinkly, I suggested that we try a simple heat lamp for about half an hour in the morning to dry it and bring the healing circulation and, keep, and help keep pain away. By the second day, his sore was noticeably smaller shallower and was beginning to dry up for the first time in months. That was the last day there for me, but it was reported that his leg just kept getting better with that regime. That's not him, by the way. Just something exceedingly uh, uh, similar. Bone spur. This was the lady that operated the lifestyle center that I was working at. She was a nurse. It's so unbelievable that I have to, I have to refer to the fact that she was a nurse and it was her own, her own experience that she ran the, the place for goodness sake. So if she says this is what it was, she, I'm just gonna have to believe this. It, Osteoarthritis is a degenerative type of arthritis that occurs more, most often in people 50 years of age and older, though it may occur in younger people too. In osteoarthritis, the cartilage in the hip joint gradually wears away over time. As the cartilage wears away, it becomes frayed and rough, and the protective joint space between the bone decreases. To make up for the lost cartilage, the damaged bones may start to grow outward and form bone spurs. Bone spurs. Osteoarthritis develops slowly and the pain it causes worsens over time. This lady, referred to as Jay, a 60 plus female acquaintance suffered for 10 years with hip pain from a bone spur on left hip and osteoporosis. The pain was intermittent and could be very debilitating. She cured her hip pain permanently by three light sessions using a 160 watt sun lamp or a UVB reptile lamp simultaneously with a 250 watt clear heat lamp because heat makes UV more effective and draws more blood. The first was 20 minutes, the next session was 30 minutes, and the final was also 30 minutes. She cured her hip pain permanently with the bone spur with three light therapy sections, sessions. 
That's amazing. No drugs required. All right, croup. Now, I'm a respiratory therapist, so I'm familiar with this. I used to set up the tents, you know, the oxygen and mist tents for croup patients, give them breathing treatments with drugs. Wow, this solution is so much simpler. All right, this is a quote from that book. This annoying cough or bark is quickly relieved by heat. The resulting increase of blood in the throat with the added heat and light gives a relief from the tickling and sense of tightness. The circulation being stimulated, any toxic poisons from the congest congestion are rapidly carried away, leaving them free and better able to ward off any other condition that a congestion of the throat might bring about. You get a two congestion and it just stops the airflow. Can't breathe. The false membrane that often forms is not so apt to become extensive if the blood is kept in good circulation. Because of the large quantities of blood in the throat, it is necessary that a longer treatment be given than for some other parts of the body. Apply the photophore until the area is rosy red and the sense of heat extends over the entire throat area. Battle Creek Photophore, page six. Earache. During the early life of most children, there is a time when the ear takes the bigger part of the mother's attention and worry. I remember having so many of those. Running ears and the colds and teething troubles all seem to affect the condition of the child as a whole. It minds less willingly and reacts to treatment less readily. Sleepless nights for both the parents and the child run down the body and tend to keep the ear trouble from healing. Because of the close relationship between the nervous system and all parts of the body, one depleting condition has a profound effect on the other parts. Early application to the ear and the size of the head will prevent the spread of the trouble. Just a light bulb. If but one ear is affected, both sides should be given the benefit of the treatment. By the stimulation of the light and heat, the blood is drawn to the parts, flushing them. The increased circulation carries off the poison deposited in the tissues and cleanses them with fresh blood. The congestion is carried away and the resulting pains from it are relieved. Should a case of running ears continue on with no let up, regardless of treatment, the doctor should be called. If the trouble is observed early enough, the severe complications will not show up and the ears will heal up without the need of out of the ordinary procedures. 10 minutes on each side will be of great help and relief. Sleep will usually come to the restless, unsleeping child with freedom from pain. Care must be taken to prevent further catching cold in the affected ear and in the side of the head. Now there are many, many other conditions that photophores help. Uh, we'll just have to see the Battle Creek Photophore booklet. All right, historical use of UV in dentistry. Remember, this is a lost art. The purpose of me showing this is to vindicate God when he said sunlight is good, to show the real value inherent in light, even in man-made light. All right, three things. Pain after extraction will in every case be relieved by exposure of six minutes for single root tooth teeth and eight minutes for multiple root teeth. This is a UV lamp. Septic tooth sockets. Ultraviolet rays are remarkably effective for that. Bleaching dead teeth. Oh, that's interesting. Pulpless teeth or teeth in which the pulps have died subsequent to filling may be rendered several shades lighter and in many cases restored their original color with ultraviolet light. 
whitening the, whitening the teeth after scaling or cleaning. Cleanse the teeth thoroughly by means of a swab of cotton wool soaked in H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, then apply the rays through a speculum for six minutes. And here's some other things that they've used this to for as well. This little book was filled with this stuff. Marginal gingivitis, acute periodontitis. Periodontitis pain is relieved in all cases by UV. Dental neuralgia, gingivitis, etc., etc. This book, it's an antique book, and they've reprinted it uh, one at a time. You order it, they print it. This one is called The Science and Practice of Dental Actinotherapy, 1928. This book is filled, for you dentists out there, is filled with detail. Detail. Not just these general principles, but detail how they did it, with what sort of lamp they used, etc., 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 and how long, etc. All right, moving on from photophores. That was just a small little sampling, just a tiny little sampling. The stories out there are abundant. Bright light boxes. Remember I told you that the Battle Creek Sanitarium did not use bright light boxes? That's why the cat is pictured here. My cat likes my light bath a lot. Anytime I turn it on, she's there, jumps right up on the chair. All right, anyway, bright light boxes. This is not gonna be what you expect. All right, winter depression. <clears throat> Many people in northern latitudes suffer from winter blues, which occurs as a reaction to reduced sunlight, right? Reduced sunlight. Reduced sunlight. Three quarters of those affected are women. Lethargy, overeating, craving for carbohydrates, and depressed mood are common symptoms. In some people, winter blues becomes depression which seriously affects their daily lives. Up to two-thirds experience depressive symptoms every winter. Bright light treatment requires a minimum of 2,500 lux to be effective. And the brightness recommended by researchers and clinicians for most people is 10,000 lux, 2,500 being the minimum. An amount which is significantly higher than standard indoor lighting. <clears throat> Most homes have light levels between 100 and 300 lux, while well-lit offices generally don't go above 700 lux. While daylight is almost always at least 10,000 lux on a clear spring morning, at noon in the height of summer, over 100,000 lux. All right, just give you a setting here. All right, how to use a bright light therapy box. 10,000 lux white, fluorescent light, no ultraviolet wavelengths. That's this article, no ultraviolet wavelengths. 15 to 30 minutes per day in the early morning upon rising. Stay awake with eyes open, not necessarily to stare at the light, um, so you may eat and or read, whatever. Determine your response after two to three weeks and adjust. After remission, individualized dosing during the rest of the winter season. Okay, that's simple enough. What about blue bright light therapy? That's a thing now too. Well, I got two things to say about that, this slide and the next. Dr. Norman Rosenthal in, wait a minute, we talked about this blue thing, didn't we? Blue light, red light, colored light. This is one of those color light things. You think I'm gonna endorse this? Dr. Norman Rosenthal, in his 2013 revision of Winter Blues, writes, from my point of view, however, a lot more testing is needed before we can conclude that blue light is safe and effective, let alone superior to white light. We know it's not superior to white light. Remember, we now have over 20 years of experience with white light, which is both safe and effective. I therefore recommend traditional white light, not blue light, for the treatment of SAD. All right, we'll talk about this later on. This is what uh, Alexander Wunsch had to say about this, this photobiologist. He says, blue light 
isolated from all other colors on the light spectrum is damaging our retinas and disrupting our endocrine system, resulting in all sorts of physical and mental illness. We don't mess with the natural order of things. God provided us with bright white light in the daytime. And it's not the presence of blue light that causes these issues. It's the absence of all the others. All those others packaged together. They work in harmony with each other. And it also resets the uh, circadian rhythms. All right, bright light therapy has been widely marketed as an effective way to prevent the winter blues. Widely marketed. We're talking about marketing right now. It's also known as seasonal affective disorders. It may have felt, and many have felt, that it has helped their sad, while others have not. You notice the way that was said, while well, many have felt that it's uh, helped them. I've read testimonies of the women saying the same thing. Well, I felt that it helped me. You know, there was this kind of doubt, could be, may not. They're not certain, but they, they kind of felt it might have. All right, and many have felt that it has helped their sad, while others have not. So why is there a disparity here? If bright light is the solution to sad, why doesn't it help everyone? It's a reasonable question. What does the science say? All right, in answer to that question, a team of researchers from Danube University in Austria searched numerous databases up to June 19, 2018, for studies on light therapy to prevent winter depression. This should be interesting. Among 3,745 records, they found only one randomized control study, including 46 people who received light therapy or no treatment. All individuals in these studies had a history of winter depression. However, even that one study was suspect because the quality of evidence was too low to draw conclusions about light therapy's effectiveness in preventing winter depression. Well, well, well that's just a fly in the ointment here, isn't it? Yet this bright light box idea is so prevalent with so many users for decades, how can it be that there's no credible proof that these work? What if bright light isn't actually the best solution? Some of you have already figured this out. Okay, let's reason this out together. Number one, sad is seasonal. The season when people move indoors. The season of low sunlight and vitamin D. But it's not just bright light that's missing, is it? It's sunlight that's missing. And sunlight's healing properties do not begin and end with bright light. We already know that. Number three, sunlight is made up of three main healing properties. Bright white light, heat, and UV. UV being the most biologically active component of sunlight. And do these light boxes have UV? No, they don't. That means that light boxes are devoid of the really good stuff. The stuff that would actually prevent and reverse SADS. Might that somewhat explain why there seems to be no credible proof of the effectiveness of this? This is from Fundamentals of Christian Education, 1923, page 35. Work performed in the open air is 10 fold more beneficial to health than indoor labor. Both the mechanic and the farmer have physical exercises, yes, yet the farmer is the healthier of the two. Nothing short of nature's invigorating air and sunshine will fully meet the demands of the system. We, again, for the third time, we don't mess with God's natural order of things and then expect fabulous healing results. Nevertheless, there's no denying that some have been helped with just the white light, even though many others have not. Could there be a better way? Let's find out. 
For example, uh, when I was uh, working on this presentation, I asked my friend, a massage therapist here, very, very into natural health and God's healing methods. I asked my massage therapist friend if she had ever used a bright light box for her seasonal affective disorder. She said that a fluorescent bright light box helped her sads. However, she immediately said, when she used a commercial tanning bed just once, she felt like a new human being, in quotes, and that it took away the constant feeling that she could not get warm. She said she was just feeling chilled to the bone in the winter times. The sad box didn't do that for her, but a tanning bed did. She had tried hot baths before going to bed, which worked, but she woke up with cold feet, but not so when she used that tanning bed just once. I asked her the duration of the tanning bed exposure and she said it was somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes with her eyes closed and no tanning glasses. I've done that before too, in smaller doses than that though. Because sunlight to the eyes is a valuable, valuable thing. I always wondered if we keep wearing, if we tan while we're wearing these things, those glasses, all the time, we're going to lose out. All right. I asked her how long did the healing effect of that tanning bed last, you know, the SADS symptoms. She replied, days to weeks. Uh, she couldn't remember exactly how long because it had been a while, but it was significant, unlike the SAD box, which she had to use daily. So, if the cause of SADS is lack of sunlight, then we give ourselves sunlight, not just one third of sunlight, even if it's the man-made version. All three healing components, UV, heat, and visible white light working together. And full body, ex now this is important, and full body exposure would be the way to do that because the benefits of sunlight are different on different parts of our bodies. Eyes, skin, genitalia, each produce different kind of benefits in sunlight. And the eyes can get the light indirectly just as we do with sunlight or through closed eyelids. Let's be clear here, when I did it, I only did it five minutes. Uh, the rest of my, say if I took a 30 minute uh, in my tanning bed, I would have my, uh, the glasses off for five minutes. That was my first time. And then the next time, 10, but I, I never went over that. She just did it once and all the 10 to 15 minutes that she did was without the, the uh, tanning glasses. By the way, there is not just one thing that changes in the winter in those brown zones. The first slide we saw is there. The available sunlight diminishes, vitamin D production diminishes or stops. It turns cold, exercise diminishes, trees lose their leaves and thus their healing fragrance. Wind and rain and snow increases and people seal themselves up in their homes. So why is the light the only thing considered in treating sad? And what happens to us when we seal ourselves up in our home for the winters? All right, the answer to that question is found in the book Healthful Living, 1897, page 481. Pretty powerful, here we go. The effect produced by living in close, ill-ventilated rooms are these. The system becomes weak and unhealthy. The circulation is depressed. The blood moves sluggishly through the system because it is not purified and vitalized by pure, invigorating air of heaven. The mind becomes, here it is, depressed, sads, and gloomy, sads, while the whole system is enervated. Enervated means drained of energy and vitality. Well, that's winter blues, isn't it? <clears throat> and fevers and other acute diseases are liable to be generated. Your careful exclusion of external air 
and fear of free ventilation leave you to breathe the corrupt, unwholesome air which is exhaled from the lungs of those staying in these rooms and which is poisonous, unfit for the support of life. The body becomes relaxed and not in a good way. The skin becomes sallow, digestion is retarded, and the system is peculiarly sensitive to the influence of cold. A slight exposure produces serious diseases in you. Great care should be exercised not to sit in a draft or in a cold room when weary or when in a perspiration. You should so accustom yourself to the air that you will not be under the necessity of having the mercury higher than 65 degrees. All my uh, slides have images on them, but this one was so straightforward, I needed to be shown all at once in one slide without being distracted by an image. So sealing oneself up in an unventilated home can produce the same symptoms as SAD. Perhaps that might explain why some are helped by bright light and others are not. Perhaps it's a ventilation issue for some, while it's a lack of sunlight for others. One way or the other, sunlight and fresh air have always worked together in harmony. Did you notice that the Battle Creek Sanitarium did not use bright light therapy? I've been collecting antique photos of the Battle Creek Sanitarium for 25 years. Upwards of 1,500 related images to them, plus a thousand more or so from other countries. Um, <clears throat> not a single photo of patients sitting around staring at light. I'm thinking that was because they didn't need them. Full body exposure to sunlight was available year round at the Battle Creek Sanitarium with light therapy. Okay. By the way, the light, this light therapy series, my entire Sun Cure series, and my health reform series all had its beginnings when I and my brothers were hired to create the Dr. Kellogg Discovery Center in Battle Creek. It turned out very good for me. My interest and involvement in the Battle Creek idea has kept growing ever since. I owned truckloads of Battle Creek sanitarium equipment, mostly light therapy equipment, some of the very things you see in this photo and the other's photos. All right, back to it. The Battle Creek Sanitarium also dealt with the whole unventilated living areas. They did not seal their patients up inside. They offered open air sleeping rooms all year round if the patient wanted it. It was not forced. They made window tents available. They rolled their invalid patients out into the fresh air as much as possible, even in the winter time. They offered open air outings year round. They had organized guided walking tours. Any excuse to get the patients out into the open air and or sunlight. Now there is one very practical advantage to bright white light therapy that we haven't mentioned. We'll just make a mention of it. It can reset your circadian rhythms and keep you fall from falling back to sleep when reading in the morning. Can't argue that. Does that. Now, here's a closing thought on bright light boxes. If you decide to keep using a bright light box, I highly recommend the fluorescent bulbs rather than the LEDs because the fluorescent bulbs at least emit a small amount of heat. Here's why that is important. Back to Dr. Alexander Wunsch. Light without its partner heat is damaging to the eyes. Near infrared is important as it primes the cells in your retina for repair and regeneration, which explains why LEDs, which is devoid of infrared, are so harmful for your eyes and health. In other words, light delivered without heat is harmful for your eyes. And, that, and the latest fad are blue light LED bright light bulbs, boxes. These are the ones without heat. All right. All light bulbs and light therapy devices can contribute to retinal damage, especially LEDs, if 
They do not emit dear infrared light or heat. He says LED light exposure that is not balanced with full spectrum, with full spectrum sunlight loaded with the red parts of the spectrum is always damaging to your biology. Here he says a kind of interesting statement. One third of the energy your body consumes comes from the food you eat. But the vast majority of the energy your body needs to maintain systemic equilibrium comes from environmental infrared light exposure. That's new. The website that hosted these quotes has been altered and these reference links for these statements have been removed, moved some other place. Fortunately, I had this down, but the link doesn't work anymore. So I didn't include it. All right, tanning chambers. From the Sanitarium News Bulletin, November 1, 1929. Our indoor sun baths are found to be one of our most effective agencies for combating degenerative disease, as well as for toning up the apparently well. Light impels the body machine, aids every vital function, and quickens every cell in the merry dance of life. Kellogg was ahead of his time. Now this is not surprising since sunlight was given the same kind of endorsement at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Sunlight as well was considered. Battle Creek Sanitarium News, September 1, 1933. This is an excerpt. Many things which are considered ultra-modern are old here. For instance, <clears throat> sunbathing in the near nude and the acquiring of a tan all over the body has been practiced here for more than 50 years, half a century. But it has never been sensationalized. In two large outdoor gymnasiums, one for men and one for women, patients get close to nature, sunbathe, exercise, play, and swim, encumbered with much less clothing than the most abbreviate swimming suit. This has long been one of the most effective treatments given here. And the present day enthusiasm for suntan, while a good thing, is just about a half century behind Battle Creek, isn't that fun? <laughs> These are some of the little um, benefits here, kind of testimonials about these uh, sun arcs. I felt ill and depressed two months ago, but since I have been using your sun arc bath, I have gained weight, feel energetic, and look the picture of health. Next one. The sun arc bath has proven an excellent means of relieving facial neuralgia and neuritis. Sunlight can do that too. Interesting. Nerve pain. Number three, I was formerly troubled with insomnia, but a few minutes with the sun bath each evening before retiring means a night of blessed sleep. Number four, my complexion's cleared up wonderfully since using your bath light. Number five, the sun arc bath has proven an excellent means of relieving facial neuralgia and neuritis. Oh, another one. A lady 28 years old who had suffered sciatic neuritis for three months duration was treated with daily application of the sun arc. She had been walking previously with the aid of crutches and opiates were being used to relieve the pain. After eight treatments, says her physician, the crutches and opiates were abandoned. No recurrence occurred in the succeeding three years. A couple more. Your sun bath has made me feel and look 10 years younger. And the last one, the children haven't suffered from a cold since taking the sun baths. These things are not surprising to those who have studied sunlight. For cases of general debility, lack of appetite, that tired feeling in both children and adults, the results of using the sun arc are often amazing. The improvement is noted with each day's treatment. An improvement in the blood condition makes the user feel brighter and better. A sense of well-being and energy, both mental and physical, pervades the whole body as a result of this method. When my wife or anyone else uses the our non-commercial tanning bed, I get that sort of statement. I feel energized, energized. She sits out in the sun, she feels energized. She sits in the tanning bed, I feel energized.
resist costly colds, coughs, bronchitis, and pneumonia. The European users of Dr. Kellogg's light therapy equipment complained to Dr. Kellogg that his light therapy equipment wasn't giving their patients the healing benefits that Dr. Kellogg claimed of them. Ooh, how's he gonna respond? Dr. Kellogg's response to them is reflected in Leonard Hill's statement in the next slide. He was following Kellogg's uh, counsel, which is self-explanatory. Here it is. Artificial light treatment conducted in warm, stagnant air indoors does not give the beneficial effect of breathing cool air or the stimulant effect on the metabolism, appetite, and muscular tone, which is derived from outdoor sun treatment, moving air upon the skin. <clears throat> Cold water sprays and fans may be brought into use to bring about some of the effects of outdoor exposure, or the arc light bath may be taken out of doors under a penthouse roof and open otherwise to moving air. Application, when you tan indoors, you use a fan, you have the windows open. Cold air, all the better. All right, let's give some random studies here. Winter colds drop 40% with ultraviolet treatments. Patients who considered themselves susceptible to colds experienced a 28 to 40% decrease in frequency of winter colds when irradiated with UV light for 10 minutes, one to three times per week throughout the winter. This is a tanning bed. Dramatic cholesterol drop with one exposure to UV. Uh, this is what it says. Patients with hypertension and related circulatory problems were exposed to UV light. Two hours after the first exposure, 97% of the patients had almost a 13% decrease in serum cholesterol levels. Within this group, 86% maintained this level 24 hours later. Vitamin D higher in sunbed users. Now, <clears throat> Subjects who used a UV emitting tanning bed at least once a week for at least five months had 90% higher serum vitamin D levels than did non-tanners. Tanning is associated with optimal vitamin D status and higher bone mineral density. Best tanning beds? Beds that use low pressure lamps that emit a, a balance of UVA and UVB radiation that replicate natural sunlight. That would be 95 to 97.5% UVA to 6% to 2.5% UVB, according to Dr. Michael Hollick in his book, The UV Advantage, 2003, page 155. According to Mark Sorensen, Every beneficial effect of vitamin D that is produced by sunlight exposure is also produced by the use of high quality tanning beds. Yet in Health News, May 29, 2014, the American Academy, you know it's not gonna be good when I put a black background and red letters. That always represents bad things or something that's not true or deception. All right, so now that you know, the American Academy of Dermatology said people exposed to UV radiation via indoor tanning have a 59% increase in the risk of melanoma, the deadliest type of skin cancer. Do we believe them? Do tanning beds and UDV, UV devices cause cancer? Well, my presentation called Cancer and God's Healing Sunlight, which is on YouTube, lays out the track record of the American Academy of Dermatology on these types of statements, which condemn sunlight as evil, even though God pronounced sunlight and its UV good. It's the same fear-mongering for profit that we have endured for generations. It's been disproven time and time again. Dr. Mercola had an article online that I quote from in the next slides that summarily dismissed the claim that tanning beds cause cancer. And I put this in my presentations long ago with the reference. Unfortunately, years of Mercola's online articles were taken down when the President of the United States during the pandemic 
targeted the 12 most daring dissenters online during the pandemic, one of them being Dr. Mercola. So the link to that article on this presentation no longer works, it's gone, but at least I have what he quoted. I have included the link to the research that he was referring to, and here is the excerpt from his article and that link. In a recent review of the available research into the relative risk for malignant melanoma and tanning bed use, the researchers concluded that tanning bed use was not associated with melanoma and in fact can decrease 10 times more cancer than they might potentially be accused of contributing to. While some oft recited data indicate that the use of tanning beds before the age of 35 is associated with a 75% increase in the risk of melanoma, mainstream media ignores the fact that this is the relative risk ratio lying with statistics. Your absolute risk of getting skin cancer from a tanning bed is less than three tenths of 1%. The overall conclusion a study reviewing 30 years of published data between 1981 and 2011 on vitamin D, sun exposure, and tanning bed use concluded that the overall health benefit of an improved vitamin D status may be more important than the possible increase in skin cancer risk resulting from carefully increasing UV exposure. Okay, that's simple. It's refuting science, you see. My conclusion, the more like sunlight, the more effective the light therapy devices. Light therapy is simple. It doesn't require a room full of the latest and greatest equipment. The Battle Creek Sanitarium used a number of different forms of light therapy devices, but just like Taco Bell, the same basic ingredients just mixed and matched differently. In the case of light therapy, bright white light, luminous heat, and ultraviolet light. This is the core of both sunlight and man-made light therapy. All right, be sure to see part two, the light bath, and part three, UV blood irradiation. Thank you for attending and watching.